Yeah, if, if possible. Uh, Asalaamu Alaikum Allah. So my young men over here, oh, the, the teenagers, high schoolers, I want you guys to come up. Everyone in this section over here, my young men, let's come over here. Jazakumullah khairan. And um, brothers, if you could, the sisters are going to be over here on this side. So just oh, yeah, to have a little bit more. Yes, yeah, so we have the brothers just kind of shifted we'll have over the this way. Sisters over here, inshallah. If we could just here. Thank you so much. Okay. Excellent, excellent. Jazakum Allah khairan. Barakallah feekum. Ahsan Allahu ilaykum. No, no, I'm, I'm ready to go. Inshallah. Oh, yeah, Jazakum Allah khairan. I appreciate that. Jazakum Allah khairan. Thank you so much. May Allah reward you. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> No, no, I'll just get started. No need for an intro. Yeah. Okay, we can get started, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa mawala. Our topic of discussion. As the, as the brother, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him and reward him, introduced is holding on to faith in difficult times. And I asked the youth if they could move up because I want you, I think they're going to bring a wireless mic. And if not, I want you to just uh, project and speak yourself. Is because I want you to reflect um, as I share the hadith and as I share the story that some of us are familiar with, I want you to think about what did you learn? How does this relate to your life? And then for you to then share with us so that we can learn. I want you to ask questions. I want you to be engaged, inshallah. So, bismillah, we're going to cover seven things, inshallah. One, what, are the, what is the status, just as a reminder, of those who believe in Islam without seeing Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Two, what is it about believing during these difficult end of times? And the brother already said the hadith, we're, we're just going to remind about it. Three, who are Ashabul Ukhdud? And I want to ask you if we could just quiet it down a little bit, inshallah. If you, if you hear someone around you talking, not for me, just for other people, inshallah, to listen. Then we can quiet down. Four, what is the measurement of success? Five, what are some modern doubts? Why do some people doubt Islam these days? And I want to share with you research from Yaqeen Institute. And for you to think about it yourself, to be like, hey, is this something, is this an area where I can strengthen my faith? Uh, six, I'm just briefly going to talk about Yaqeen's mission and the resource table that we have outside for you to benefit from. And then seven, I want to hear your reflections and, and your questions. So think about it, inshallah. So first, the status of those who believe without meeting him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Anas ibn Malik, radiallahu anhu wa ardah, and this is in Musnad Ahmad, he narrates that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Blessed are those who had faith in me and saw me. And blessed seven times, literally seven times more, he makes dua for you and for me, for us, for those who believe in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam without seeing him. And in the second hadith, and this is Sahih, in the second hadith by Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu ardah, he narrates sallallahu, that sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went to a graveyard. And in this graveyard, he's making dua. And he said, peace be upon you, abode of believing people, O believing people. And he says, if Allah wills, we're going to join you soon. And then he adds, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, 
Would that I had seen our brothers. I wish I saw our brothers. So the Sahaba are just weirded out at this point. They're like, wait a second, Ya Rasulullah. Aren't we your brothers? And he said, no, no, you're, you're my companions. My brothers are those who have not come yet. And he says, I'm going to reach the Hawd before you. So who knows what the Hawd is? That's the first question. I know we don't have a wireless mic yet, so you can project. Hawd, I'm asking the youth, what is the Hawd that the Prophet Muhammad is referring to? Raise your hand. Yes. Raise your, raise your hand. It's like a pool, yeah? And it's, imagine a, a huge lake that the believers are going to bring a drink from. What else? Describe it to me. Anybody know? How big is it? Yeah. Huh? A square. I'm not sure about the shape, but tell me about its magnitude. How huge do you think it is? It t yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just raise your voice. I, I couldn't hear you. It's really, really long? You're right. If you were to travel for one month, one whole month, then you'd reach the end of it. That's how huge it is for one month. And it's in one month in every direction, so it's huge. How sweet is it? Sweeter than honey. It's sweeter than honey, whiter than milk, this, this hold. And he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that those people who believed in me without seeing me, I'm going to reach it before them. And we ask Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala to make us from the people who he gives uh, to drink. And he said he's going to recognize us. Uh, how? Does anybody know? How is he going to recognize the believers on that day? Yes. By the white coming from our body. What's, why is there going to be white on our bodies? Yeah, go ahead. Because of wudu. Because of wudu. Literally, when you're making wudu, think about that. Be like, hey. And he even said, he's like, do any of you know your horses when they have the white blazes? And right now, not many of us own ho horses. <laughs> But some of us have cats, right? Or some of us have other animals, and they might have like patches on them, and you're like, oh, I know that's my cat, or I know that's my hamster, or I know that's my ferret, or I know that's my fish, or I know that's, you know, my bird. And you know them. He's like, I'm going to know them. I'm going to be like, oh, this is from my ummah because you made wudu. So again, this is the special status that you all have. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve it for us. Two, in terms of, jazakumullah khairan, in terms of believing at the end of time, so I'm just going to mute this, and then I need, I need a volunteer who's going to run around and give it to people. Who wants to be the volunteer? You in the back? You want to be the volunteer? Do you want to volunteer? He raised his hand before anyone. There's, a, there's an interesting hadith, you know, come, come on, bismillah, come up. There's an inter interesting hadith where one of the sahaba, he stands up, and he says, uh, he, he asked the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to make dua. dua. And then Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam makes dua for him and his akhir, it's beautiful dua. And then the next Sahabi is like, oh, this sounds awesome. How about me? I want the same thing. And he said, no, sabaqaka ukasha. This Sahabi, he beat you to it. So I, I, I made it for him. And so he beat everyone else, mashallah, to it. So here, when you want to turn it on, just press that button. Try it. And then when you want to turn it off, press it again if no one's talking. Okay, so you can sit wherever and just like keep, keep your eye out for people who raise their hand. Bismillah. Two out of the seven. So what is it about belief at the end of times? We know this hadith, he already mentioned it, but just to, to quickly review. Um, the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that there's going to come a time where, I'm not going to read the whole hadith, it's a really long hadith, but basically he says, just to be a believer is like holding on to ember. Now who knows what ember is? Ember. Okay, go ahead. Is a spark that emits from fire, like burning fire. Okay, it's actually hotter than a spark. Who knows what ember is? When the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi is telling us these things, we, we have to really visualize them. Okay, raise your hand if your parents have done barbecues before. All right? So we've all been to a barbecue before. Okay, you can put your hands down. So you know when your parent might be lighting it up, right? Now, after they light it up, there's a lot of fire that comes out. Now, after the fire goes away, 
You know the, the coals, the charcoal? That's like red. And if you were to come even like two feet away from it, you feel that burn? You know what I'm talking about? That's what the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is talking about. You, can't, you literally can't even come close to it. I know because I love barbecuing. So I know when it gets to 500 degrees and I open up my grill, I can't even come close to it. He said it's like holding that with your hand. That's how difficult the situation is that you're in right now and that we're all in together to just be a Muslim. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We ask Allah to make us firm in our iman. The main story I wanted to talk about, and I want you to reflect. There are so many lessons that I wrote, but I want to hear from you. I want you to think about, hey, I thought of the monk and I thought of the sorcerer and this is what the, about the story of Ashabul Ukhdud. Ashabul Ukhdud. It's a story that I think a lot of us have heard before, but I want us to just make this a reflective conversation. Who's heard of Ashabul Ukhdud before? You've heard of Ashabul Ukhdud before? Good. Anybody else? You have? Probably when I start saying the story, you're like, oh, this sounds a little bit familiar. You got it, mashallah. Good. So, bismillah. So, Suhaib radiallahu anhu arda, good job. He says that Rasulullah sallam said that there was a king before you. And this king used to have a magician, a sorcerer. And the guy used to do magic for him because he's a big king, he's wealthy, he's powerful. He's like, do some tricks for me. Instead of having a TV or a phone, that's what he used to do for entertainment. Some people we know, they used to have jokers, right? Who here has played cards before? Have you seen cards? You see the joker, right? He, he's with the king, he's with the queen, because he was there to just make jokes, to entertain. Well, he used to have a magician. And this magician started getting old. And he's like, look, king, I, I'm getting old right now. Bring me a young boy who I can teach magic to. And so he brings him a young boy, and he's like, okay, Teach him your magic so that he can be my magician after that. But this boy had a problem. He was very curious. He was a curious little boy. So he ends up on his way to the magician. He saw this monk. Who knows what a monk is? A monk. Okay, she raised her hand first. You're eliminated from raising your hand. I'm just kidding. We'll, we'll give you a chance <laughs> in, the, in the pink. What's a monk? A monk is like someone who um, like believes in a religion. You're right. That's good. Believes in a religion. I want to hear more. What else? They don't just believe in a religion. What do they usually do? Yeah. Uh, monks are kind of like, um, they're probably one of the most very religious people. They practice the religion a lot. They read a lot of the texts. They're someone you might go to for like asking questions about a religion. Yep, yep. More information. Who knows other details about monks? Yeah, in the, in the green hijab or khimar. About monks. What is a monk? Tell us about a monk. A monk is uh, someone who believes in a religion and uh, goes into hiding and doesn't really come out. Exactly. And do we have monks in Islam? We don't, actually. We don't have monkhood. But they used to have it in, in Christianity in previous religions. You might have seen a Buddhist monk. They're like, I don't get married. I stay away from people. I just sit by myself. But in Islam, yes, you have to sit by yourself sometimes, but also you have to go out, go to the masjid, make da'wah, interact with people. Even if you're harmed, the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, go out. So this is a monk because this is a previous religion. Some say it was Christianity at the time. So he goes, he hangs out with him. He's like, hey, I want to hang out with you. Now, what do you think would happen when he's hanging out with the monk? After some time, he's like, I got to go to the magician. So what would he be? He'd be late. And what do you think the magician did to him when he was late? Yeah, what do you think he would do to him? He would punish him. How do you think he punished him? Whip. He beat him. Yeah. That's what used to happen. Our parents and our grandparents, when they were late, they used to get hit with a stick or a paddle or something or a ruler, right? That's what used to happen. And so he would be late. And he's like, I keep getting beat. Can you help me out here? So the monk's like, I have an idea. Every time you're late to the magician, tell him that your family kept you. And every time you're late to your family, tell them the magician kept, kept me. You know, so you can kind of like manage politically, you know, be diplomatic between people. And so 
he, he kept going to the monk and learning some stuff from him and going to the magician and learning some stuff from him. And then one time, he's walking on the road and he says, this beast, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, this beast came across the road. And he, he got afraid. Everybody got afraid. They're like, what are we supposed to do? Maybe in these days, has anybody here ever seen a bison? A bison? You've seen a bison in person. In person? Where'd you go? Can you give him the mic? I'm curious. <laughs> Yellowstone. Yellowstone, yeah. So I've seen bison before as well in Texas. If you've ever driven next to a bison, this beast, I was next to a bison with my son, and when we were there, we were taking pictures, and then my son started arguing with his friend. She's also five years old. And then the bison looked at us with his eye. His eye was about this big. And he's like, <laughs> and you can bet I, I, I drove away because he would he can flip over the car. I mean, he, they're massive creatures. They're very scary creatures. And so he saw a beast. He saw some, something huge there. And he's like, I want to see who's teaching me the right things. Is the magician teaching me the truth? Or is the monk teaching me the truth? So he picks up a stone and he says, he says, Oh Allah, if the way of the monk is dear, he probably said that. He was like, come on, you beast. If the way of Allah, if the way of the monk is dearer to you than the way of the magician, then bring about death to the animal so that the people can move freely. They can cross the road. He takes the stone and he throws it. And then the beast died. And he's like, what? From this stone, the beast died. Wow. It means the monk was right all along and the magician is wrong. So he goes back to the monk and he's like, hey, you know what, this is crazy. I've been learning from you. I've been learning from this other guy two ways. And they're two ways that contradict each other. They go against each other. And I found out, and I threw the stone and I found out your way is, is correct. And he's like, son, today you're better than me. Your level of iman, your level of faith is better than even me. The student has surpassed the teacher. And he says, you've come to a stage where I feel like Allah is going to test you. This is another one of the lessons. He's like, when your iman gets that strong, you're going to face a test. It's going to be really serious. But he's like, don't reveal me. I'm your secret teacher. Don't tell anybody about me. So time goes on, and this young boy is like, wow, I kind of got a superpower. It's called dua, by the way. And he's, he, people who are sick start coming to him, and he's like, ya Allah, cure this person. Person gets cured. Ya Allah, cure this person who has leprosy. It was a disease that was very rampant at the time. They're cured. Ya Allah, this person's sick. Cure them. Everyone's getting cured. Until one of the king's courtiers, who's a person who would work in his, in his basically his like office, if you will, he comes up to him and he's blind. And he's like, hey, look. If you cure me, I'm going to give you so much money. I'm going to give you so much gifts. Listen, kid, I can't see. Help me out. So what does the kid do? He's like, I don't cure anybody. It's not me. Who is it who is curing? Allah. Again, he's humble. He's like, it's not me. I'm not doing anything. It's Allah. So he says, but in the name of Allah, Ya Allah, cure this man. And he's cured. And so he goes back to the king. And this king was like Fir'aun. Who did Fir'aun think was Allah? Himself. He was deluded. He's like, I am God. Hasha lillah. He's like, I am God. That's what he said. This king was the same. He's, so the man comes back. And instead of like stumbling around or using his walking stick or kind of feeling the walls, he just comes back and sits down. And the king's like, what? You can see? What happened? He's like, my eyesight got cured. He said, who cured it? What happened? He said, Rabbi, my Lord cured me. He said, you mean me? He's like, no. My Lord and your Lord, Allah. And the king gets mad. He's like, whoa. Do you know who I am? I'm in a position of power here. You literally said that I'm not the Lord? And so what does he do? He takes him and he starts punishing him and he starts torturing him. And we don't know the details, but you can imagine the gruesome details of the pain he's putting him in until he tells him, tell me who did this. Tell me who did this. And then he says, it was this boy. 
the boy that your magician was teaching. So he brings the boy. He's like, hey, look, look, I know you're a wise guy here. The magician works for me, and you're learning from him. So now you learned all this magic and stuff, cut it out. All right? I'm the big head honcho here. And the boy's like, look, I didn't do anything. It's from Allah. It's from Rabbi wa Rabbuk. It's from my Lord and your Lord. And he's like, who taught you this? It wasn't the magician. And he wouldn't tell him. So what, did he, what do you think he did with the boy? The same thing he did to the sorcerer. He kept punishing him and torturing him and punishing him until the boy, I mean, he was in so much pain. You can't blame him. He's a little boy. He said the monk. So he called the monk. He brought the monk. And after he brought the monk, he starts punishing him and punishing him and punishing him until he says, I want to make an example out of you. And what he does, and it, you know, excuse me if this is gruesome, but it's what happened as he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He basically stood him up and he took like a, a sort of saw and boom, cut him in half and just killed him. And um, then he brought back his worker and he's like, okay, look, you saw what happened to that guy. You saw how I killed him. Now leave your religion and believe in me. Don't believe in Allah, believe in me. And what did the, the guy who works for him said? He's like, no way, no way. He had faith. And he did the same thing. He cut him in half and he killed him. And then he came to the boy. Bismillah. He came to the boy and he said the same thing. And he said... And it's no worries if the kid is crying. I have a kid and they cry as well. It's okay. Don't, don't worry about it. Alhamdulillah, we're in a masjid. In the masjid of Rasulullah Sallallahu there would be kids crying. We wouldn't have the hadith about, hey, quicken your prayer if there's crying of a baby, if there weren't babies in the masjid. So Alhamdulillah, I just want to say that so no one feels uncomfortable. He tells the boy, look, look boy, I've killed the monk. I've killed the guy you cured of blindness. Now he's dead. You're next. Leave your religion. He's like, no. I'm not. <laughs> I found the truth. I am not. I don't care what you do to me. He's like, okay. He gets some of his workers and he says, take him to the tallest mountain we have. And then you tell him at the threat of death, either you leave your religion or we're going to throw you off. They say, okay. They take him. He's a kid. What can he, he can't fight back. He goes up there. And when he gets to the top of the mountain, he says, Ya Allah, help me. I'm weak. I'm nothing. But you, you're all powerful. Ya Rabbi, help save me from these people. So the mountain literally shakes. All the people fall and die except for him. And then who comes walking back to the city? The boy. You just see the boy walking back. And the king's shocked. He's like, wait, where are all my soldiers? What happened? He's like, they're all gone. He said, fine. Okay, okay. He takes other, other soldiers and he's like, take him out way far to sea. Take him on a boat and, and tell him, if you don't leave your religion, we're going to throw you overboard and you're going to drown. No one's going to help you. So they say yes. They take him on a boat and they take him out to sea, out to the water. And they're like, are you going to leave your religion or not? And he says, Ya Rabbi, what can I do, Ya Rabbi? I only have you. Save me. Save me, Ya Allah. All the people fall overboard. Ab overboard. They all drown except for him. He comes back. He sees the, guy, the kid walking back. So he's dumbfounded at this point. The king's like, what is going on? Why can't I kill you? So the boy tells him, I'll tell you how to kill me. You want to know how to kill me? I'll tell you. He says, okay, how? He says, gather everybody in the city. Every single person. Bring them here and tie me up to the trunk of that tree. Get your bow, get your arrow. And, and you have to say, in the name of Allah... In the name of Allah. I'm going to look up the exact word, wording right now. And he says, In the name of Allah, the Rabb of the young boy. In the name of Allah, the Lord of this young boy. And then you shoot the arrow and I'm going to die. Because you, you, you invoked Allah's name. Not your name, Allah's name. He said, okay, if that's what it takes to kill you, I'm going to do it. So he gathers everybody. Imagine a crowd of hundreds of people. Potentially thousands, because one narration said there were 20,000. 
but it's, it's not like a hadith narration, okay? So the authenticity is questionable. They're all watching. He ties up the boy. He takes his bow. He takes his arrow. And if you see, saw some cartoons about this, you'll see he tried to shoot a few times. But that, that wasn't in the hadith that I found. So I'm not going to add that in. And in front of everyone, he says, In the name of Allah, the Lord, the God, the Rabb of this boy. And he shoots. And the arrow goes and it hits him in the temple right here. Or right here on the side. Hits him. The boy grabs it. And then he dies. As a shaheed. And the people are all looking and they're like, Oh my God! That means this king is not, is not God! That means there's another God! And one of the men actually turns to the king and he's like, Do you realize what you just did? You just told everybody to be a believer in Allah! And so the king is now like, Okay, I, I've killed the monk. I've killed my worker. I've killed the boy. All of you right now, listen. I'm going crazy right now. If you don't believe in me, if you believe in Allah, then you're next. And they held true to their faith. And they said, we don't care what you do to us. And this is similar for those of you who know the story of Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam. Very similar. A lot of parallels with bringing everybody, the magicians, the magicians who are like, he's Allah. He's like, I'm going to cut your right hand and left foot or, or left hand and, and, and right foot. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to crucify you. I'm going to torture you. And they say, we don't care. This is the truth. No matter what you do to us, you're not going to take the iman from our hearts. And so he digs a very deep trench. And this is why they're called al-ukhdud, which means the trenches. He puts fire in it. And this is again a parallel to Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam, who was a boy. Because he had faith, because he believed, they catapulted him into the fire. And he said, one by one, come here. Do you believe in Allah or do you believe in me? And they say, I believe in Allah. He's like, throw them in. Either you jump in or, or we're going to throw you in. One by one. And again, I said, there was a narration I saw. It's not a hadith. It's from a later, uh, one of the historians. And he said, potentially 20,000 people. 20,000 people. And we know that one of the last people was a mother. And she was holding her baby. And she hesitated for a little bit. I mean, can't you imagine? I mean, you know, for, for those of us who are youth, we don't have children. We, we can't imagine maybe the love of a mother to a child. But think back to your own moms and what they would do to you, for you. What they've done for you already. What they've sacrificed. That love of the mother. There's nothing like the love of a mother, subhanAllah. Even me as a father, I'm telling you. The love of a mother is, is on a whole different level, subhanAllah. And she hesitated for a little bit. She's holding her baby. And the baby spoke. And this is one of the few babies in the history of humanity who spoke, as Rasulullah said. And the baby, <coughs> the baby looks up at his mother or her mother and says, Oh mother, listen mom, endure this. Take this right now, this fire, because you're on the right path. You're doing something right. And so she jumps in. And they die as martyrs. I want you to just reflect on... There were so many lessons within that. And I want you to reflect on what you've learned or what you reflected upon. I just have like two minutes. Just going to say a couple of things. And then, and then I want to open it up for you to talk. For you to say, here, you know, when you were talking about this part, I thought of this. Or this part, I thought of that. And then after reflections for like 10 minutes, we'll go into just general Q&A of, of the, the doubts that we're facing, facing in terms of our own faith and how we can strengthen it. So, the measure of success. This is uh, number four out of the seven. The measure of success. Does anybody know the story, the hadith of the man that's brought for, forward on Yawm Al-Qiyamah and he lived the most lavish, wonderful life and the hadith of the one who comes and he's like, something happens to him and he's, he thinks about his life and the, the person who comes and he lived the most difficult life. Does anybody know that hadith from the youth? I know I'm not giving you a lot of context here. Yes. Why don't we give the mic to the, the brother in the back there? Tell us about that hadith. I want to hear it from you. Uh, from what I remember, the person who lived the most lavish life, 
he will be brought on the day of judgment and he will be dipped for a, for a split second for just a moment in Jahannam and he will be asked what do you remember of your lavish life and he will say I don't remember anything I don't remember a single moment I lived in, in luxury and peace and the other person who lived his life full of misery he will be brought on the day of judgment and he will be dipped in, in Jannah for, for just a split second. Yeah. And he will be brought out and he will be realized, what do you remember of your misery? He said, I don't remember a single moment of, of misery I've ever passed. Allah. Jazakum Allah khairan. Takbir. MashaAllah. Good job. That means, you know, once you get into like math and stuff and you start looking at infinity, which is, I mean, it's a theory, right? Infinity. But when you try to compare infinity to anything, something that's perpetual to anything, something that's so amazing, there's no comparison. There's no comparison. Can you compare your strength to the strength of an ant? Like you're able to pick up that chair. An ant can't do that. There's just, there's no comparison. So no matter how difficult our lives are here in this world, when you just, you're dipped into Jannah, you forget everything. And some of you, Yani, you're young. You might not have faced difficulty in life. I can tell you, all of us who are older, we've faced hard times. Times come in life where, you're, where they're hard. Guess what happens after? You forget everything. It's like it didn't happen. You just remember the good, subhanAllah, when you're in a good state. And the opposite is true. When you're in a bad state, subhanAllah, sometimes you forget all the good. And so this shows us the true measure of success is the akhirah. Uh, number five, what are some modern doubts? So modern doubts. Like what are some issues that people are dealing with nowadays in terms of faith? There are three things. So Yaqeen Institute, where I work and where Brother Mahad works, and he's at the table outside. It's right out there. So I want, I want you to, inshallah, visit and, and, uh, and check out some of our free resources that are for you, like the app. Download the app. Look at Yaqeen Academy. Look at the videos. Look at the infographics. Look at Yaqeen Conversations, which uh, Brother uh, Justin Abdurrahman Wood told me that he's done with the youth here a few times before. Our first research paper actually asked hundreds of Muslims said, why are you ha struggling with your Iman? And they found that there were three major areas. The first area was morality and social norms. Things like sexuality, gender, Islamic history, and social justice. People started thinking about these issues and they're like, wait, I, you know, I, I was taught this way in school and not Islamic school, but you know, I was taught this way, I was taught this way from society, from videos, from books, and then Islam is like this, how is that compatible? And they were struggling with that. The second major issue that caused people to struggle with their faith is trauma. Does anybody know what trauma means? Trauma. Uh, who hasn't? I'm going to give it to him because you haven't spoken first. Even though your hand wasn't the first. You got it. Bismillah. What does trauma mean? Um, it means like you're really scared. When you're really scared? Good. What else? Trauma. I'm looking, mashallah, you've been very active. Okay, you haven't spoken yet, so in the red sweatshirt. It's like a traumatic experience that's happened in your life, and it's like not something good. Like what? Like, for example, you, um, you had so, like a bad experience in your life of something, and you're like traumatized from it. Yeah, like... It could be like, from like... Uh, uh, falling off, scaring of some, scared of something, or like a fear of something, and like falling off a trampoline or something, and then you get traumatized from it or something. Yeah, like let's say you were in a car accident. That's traumatic. Let's say your family died. That's traumatic. We have brothers and sisters in our community who are refugees in every single community, including this community. They came from war, bombs falling down, bullets going through, even sometimes, subhanAllah, in our city here. There are people who, the brother was telling me, Muslims who have been killed by gun violence. That's traumatic. And so because of these instances, they have, either if it's acute, communal, or prolonged, they have doubt in their faith. Like, how did Allah allow this to happen? And the third major concern is philosophical and scientific concerns. Basically stuff like evolution, perennialism, if you know what that term means, criticism of the Quran and Hadith, new atheism, and what's really interesting, you might not believe this, I was really shocked, subhanAllah. Several years ago when Yaqeen was started, we were looking at the Islamophobic industry. Does anybody know what the Islamophobic industry is? What is the Islamophobic industry? I want someone who hasn't spoken before. You know? 
You know what the Islamophobic industry is? Do you want to talk? It's okay if you don't know. Do you want to talk? Okay, Let, let's give it to him, Bismillah. And I'm only preventing you two because, mashallah, I want more people to, to speak and be active. May Allah reward you for your good intentions. Go ahead. What's Islamophobia? You know, if you, if you don't know and you say, I don't know, then you've mastered a lot of knowledge. Because being able to say publicly, hey, I don't know. I don't know. That I'm brave. Takbir. That's really brave. We have to celebrate that when people say, I don't know. MashaAllah. I'm proud of you. In the, in the back. In the back. MashaAllah. MashaAllah. Inducing the fear of Islam. Yes. Okay. MashaAllah. Very technical definition. I like that. Anybody else? Yes. In the back over there. Um... It's like hatred and discrimination towards like Muslims. Yeah, so basically the industry, what they would do is millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars, they would spend it, they would publish papers, and they would say, actually, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu he was X, Y, Z. You know how they used to attack him in the, in the time of Quraysh and the, and the Mushrikun and in that time, and it's mentioned in the Quran and all the Prophets were attacked for these things? They revived and they started attacking and attacking more and attacking more. And they would have these, this script of, hey, attack this question and that question and this question. Well, mashayikh from all over the U.S. and Canada started coming together. And they're like, hey, when the youth in our masjid, they're coming and they have questions for us. They're the same exact questions that this industry is publishing and working on. The same exact questions. And so we realized as an organization that it wasn't just to like change the news or the media so that they would do wars and... And, and send drones to like Afghanistan and Somalia and Yemen and, and Syria. No, they're actually affecting our Iman here in, the, in America as well. And, 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 and that's why Yaqeen came to, to be about. It was to dismantle doubts. So when someone has those doubts, those questions, those difficult questions, it answers them. To nurture conviction. If you've seen the Ramadan series with like Sheikh Omar Suleiman, Part of Yaqeen, like angels in your presence, Allah loves meeting Muhammad Sallallahu a judgment day, deeds that light the way, or Quran 30 for 30 to like build Iman. And the last was nurturing, uh, was inspiring contribution because when you see great Muslims, confident Muslims, who the reason that they're so influential is because of their Islam, it's inspirational. And when you have that Iman, you can get to that. That's part of Yaqeen's mission. We have a lot of free things and free resources just for you to strengthen your faith. Uh, I want to open it up for reflections right now, and you can start with the first reflection, since, mashallah, you've been so patient, and you've got a lot of steps. If you had a, a Fitbit, you'd get a lot of steps, mashallah. What's your reflection? I want to know, what did you learn from the story? How does that connect with your life? What's a different thing? And I'm just opening it up, inshallah, for youth to share reflections. And the parents will please forgive me. I, I want them to speak, inshallah. Go ahead. Um, I learned that... Um, as long as like you have strong faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it's capable of miracles. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Others, raise your hand. This is just for you to just talk. What did you learn from the story? What, what instance, what little part of it meant something to you? Yeah, in the back there, mashallah. That you can do anything like with Allah's help. You can do anything with Allah's help? Absolutely. Never never be deterred and be like, oh, it's so difficult. Yeah. The sister in the in the green hijab. The sister in the green hijab. Uh, in the green green hijab. Um, I learned that if you uh uh, you should keep your iman strong no matter what you go through. Say that one more time. You should keep your iman strong and? And no matter what you go through. No matter what you go through. You're going to face difficulty. In the beginning of Surah Al-Ankabut, Allah says, do you think that you're just going to say we believed and you're not going to be tested to see how firm this belief is? Tests will come your way and you have to be firm. Other, other lessons. Yeah, go ahead. Reflections. 
that um, at most 20,000 people died for Allah in their belief in Allah. MashaAllah. They, they, they literally gave up their lives for faith, which is like the highest level, right? They died as, as shuhada because they said, it doesn't matter. I'm not leaving my faith. No matter what you do to me, I'm going to stay firm. And they, were, they had conviction, yeah. Um, same thing he said. Same thing, okay. Ditto. Others? Yes, a reflection there. I learned that even if like you have to, um, especially us, we have to have our iman very strong because like right now there aren't even any punishments like getting to fire, cutting in half, but still we're like not patient and ungrateful. So we need to have strong iman. Exactly, exactly. Jazakallahu khaira. Exactly. We're not going through that, alhamdulillah, right now. We can practice our religion. No one's stopping us from coming to the masjid. No one's stopping us from coming to the halaqat. No one's stopping us from being active in the youth group, going and even socializing. I'm telling you, the Nabi Sallallahu says that you are upon the religion of your close friend, your khalil. So look at who your close friends are. Surround yourself with good company. Not just Muslims, Muslims, but also Muslims who encourage you to pray, who encourage you to fast, who encourage you to read Quran, who encourage you to be better versions of yourself and reach your potential. Other reflections? Yeah. Um, I learned that uh, you should give your, like, you should have faith and give up anything for it. Yeah. The faith is the most important thing. And again, that's why we started Yaqeen. Our scope is on faith. Some people ask, do you teach Salah? No. Do you teach Tahara? How do you like make Wudu? What's pure water? No. Do you teach Thiqa? No. Do you teach Aqeedah? Aqeedah meaning what? Meaning here, here are the tenets of Aqeedah as a formal study? No. But we focus specifically on what are the issues that help people stay firm in their faith. Other reflections? Okay. Did you go already? Another reflection. Go ahead. So, not necessarily something I learned, but something that came apparent during the talk is that as Muslims, our faith is our most important things to hold on to in this life and in the next. Excellent. How many lives do we have? Anybody know? How many lives do we have? Yeah. One? One? Two? More? What do you think? In the in the back, in the in the red, yeah, red and uh, blue shirt. Can you get it to him? Two more, more than that. Yeah. Yes. Three more. How many lives do we have? Yeah. Five. Yes, we actually have five lives. Sounds pretty crazy, right? You want me to tell you how we have five lives? The first life is before this life. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gathered all of us and He said, Alastu bi rabbikum, am I not your Lord? And we said, Bala. We said, yes, all of us admitted to that. And this is very interesting. I was talking to a brother a little bit ago and he was telling me, you know, sometimes you meet someone and you just feel like, I feel like I've known you forever. Right? You ever had that happen? As you get older and you meet more people, you're like, I feel like I know you. And the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam actually has a hadith where he talks about al-arwahu junudun mujannada. He talks about souls. And he says that in this previous life, when some souls were closer to others, فَمَنْ تَعَارَفَ مِنْهَا تَلَفْ So the people who knew each other kind of before, you kind of meet them and you just connect. And um, I forget the second part, but it, it basically, وَمَنْ تَخَالَفَ مِنْهَا And I forgot what he says. Does anybody remember the Arabic? Say it again. Jazakumullah khairan. And whoever, like, they, they, they weren't necessarily that close, then subhanAllah, they don't. The second life is this life, al hayatu dunya, this lower life. This life is basically the exam. This is the test right here. The third life is after death. After death, it's not the end of it. There are still three more lives. And that's between death and when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to command the 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 earth to spit out all of us we're all going to be launched out we're all going to come back to life and he's going to resurrect us so in that time period that stage the fourth life is yawmul qiyamah and there's so many ahadith to describe it 
how, how we're going to be, where we're going to be standing, how it's a flat land, how, how hot it's going to be, how the sweat is going to reach, the people who are shaded, including youth whose, whose hearts are tied to the masajid. May Allah grant you all that. Allahumma ameen. And the fifth life is either Jannah or Jahannam. And that is the one that we should be focused on. But even after death, you start to experience... It's like, you know, before a main dish, you have appetizers. It's like, come on, you know, I want to I wanna wet my tongue a little bit with something, get a little taste of something, drink something. That's like death. So the one who's going to Jannah starts to experience it. And the one who's, may Allah protect us from that, starts to experience it. Good. Other reflections. Other reflections. Yes, over there in the back. Bismillah. I want to hear, for, sir, first of all, mashallah, very impressed. Keep it coming in terms of just thinking and contemplating. This is part of being a Muslim. It's that tafakkur and also that tadabbur, deep contemplation. Allah will help you in the hardest times. Exactly. Allah helps you. Sometimes you can't turn to your friends. You can't turn to your family. You can't turn to your husband, your wife, your mom, your dad, your son, your daughter your brother, your sister. Sometimes you feel like you're all alone. Like Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salam, when his brothers threw him in the well, he was all alone. Like Sayyidina Yunus alayhi salam, when he was in the belly of the whale, at the bottom of the sea, all alone. And what did they do in those situations? They're like, I have nobody but Allah. And sometimes Allah, He puts us in those situations so that we can turn back to Him and be like, you know what, I recognize. I can't rely on my money, on my fame, on my job, on my grades, on my this, on my family, on my connections, on my that, on my social media followers. I have to rely on Allah. And He's the only one who can get me through this. Good. Other reflections? Yes. And then we'll come back to you, inshallah. And after these two reflections, we have like, I think, seven or eight minutes I want to open it up for just general QA. I want to hear what you're experiencing in terms of your own faith, what you've seen other people. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I realized that the, the story you told about the Ashab al uh, the youth of this time are like those people, as in we go to school and we learn all these things. We go to college, we learn all these things. And on the, on the contrary, we come to the masjid and the par and parents shall tell, tell us things and, the, and our imam tells us things and they're both uh, clashing and so at one point we realize we either we either fall into the traps of 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 the of the modern world or we we realize the truth and we end up sticking to our faith yes and that's why when people say oh were you born muslim i tell them no i wasn't born muslim i wasn't they say what are your parents muslim yes are your grandparents muslim yes are your great grandparents yeah great 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 yeah they were all muslim but I wasn't born Muslim. They say, what do you mean? I say, we're all born on fitrah. Fitrah is the natural inclination towards iman, towards tawheed, towards good. And Muslim families help nurture and cultivate that. But I came to a point in my life, I remember I was in fifth grade, where I sat down with my dad and I said, hey, how do I know that this is true? You're telling me that some angel went to the middle of the desert in this place called Bekka, which became Mecca, and he came to this man called Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and you know he received this thing called Wahi, and it's the Quran. And my dad, here's what he told me. I mean, he was working in Dawa for many, many years before. He was like, "Those are good questions, you know, my son. Sit down and read. You really want to know? You got to read and you got to pray. You got to say, Ya Rabb, whoever my Lord is, guide me to the truth." He gave me, I know some parents might not do this, but he literally gave me a Bible. He said, read the Old Testament, read the New Testament, read the Quran, read this. And I'm here for you if you have questions. He's like, but this is your journey and you have to, you have to make this decision. I'm not making it for you. I gave you all the tools. I put you in Islamic school. I gave you the, the stuff. I did everything. And I'm here for you, but you have to make the decision. And I sat there and I started reading. I started reading the Bible and I started reading this and I read the Quran. I read it. Anybody know uh, Abdullah Yusuf uh, Ali's translation in old Shakespearean English? Yeah, I couldn't understand half of it, all right? But I sat there, that's what was available at the time, and I was reading it. And I remember as I was reading it, something entered my heart, and I was like, oh my God, the one who sent this message 
is the same one who created me and created the skies and created the earth and created everyone and everything in creation. And he's my Lord and Islam is the truth. And it's, it, it wasn't actually a logical reason. Like I added up this and, you know, no, it was just, this is the truth. I can't deny it. And my heart knows that this is the truth. And I was sincerely, and so I made a decision consciously that I'm going to be a Muslim. And this is my faith. And until death, we, we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants us death upon an unwavering La ilaha illallah Muhammadan Rasulullah. Yes, your reflection. You had a reflection, right? Four more minutes. Um, build a strong connection with Allah and always have sabr. Yes, that connection. So you, you have to nurture that connection. You're not going to get the connection until you spend alone time with Allah. Which means what? Make it a part of your day to spend 15 minutes, even 5 minutes, and say, hey, after Fajr, I'm just going to spend 5 minutes, just me and Allah. I'm going to say, subhanAllah, I'm going to think about Allah. I'm going to think about creation. I'm going to read one line of Qur'an, one ayah of Qur'an, half a page of Qur'an, and I'm going to read a translation that actually flows better than I understand. Like MAS Abdul Halim is an excellent translation. I'm just going to read it and just think about it. I'm going to read one hadith and think about Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You have to, this is, it's like a muscle. You have to build that. Iman doesn't come from just, you know, just living about our lives. But we actually have to consciously work on cultivating it. And when you taste the sweetness of faith, I'm telling you, it doesn't matter if a Harvard professor comes to you and tells you, hey, you know, Muhammad in this age and he did that. You're going to be like, look, look, I've tasted it. I've experienced it. It doesn't matter what you tell me. I'm not going to lose my faith. I will go to the grave with this. And that's how you, but again, you have to cultivate it. You have to cultivate it. Any questions that anybody has? Questions? Before we end, inshallah, we have a few minutes. And if we end early, it's just time to renew wudu. Questions? Okay, then I want to, I want to, again, I want to thank, uh, I want to thank the board, the administration, the volunteers, the youth, the parents, the whole community, mashallah. It's my honor and, uh, and Brother Maher's honor as well to come here on behalf of Yaqeen Institute for Islamic Research. It was very nice to uh, speak with you all. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses this community. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants this community uh, iman and kamila, perf perfect faith. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserves the iman of this community, of the youth and of the elders. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a traveler, and I pray that this dua is mustajab, that it's answered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that He give you all the very best in the dunya and the very best in the akhirah. And He make you strong believers who enjoin the good, who forbid the evil, who have the Qur'an not only memorized, but also practice upon its teachings and have complete and full love for Allah and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika nashhadu an la ilaha illa ant nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And I believe Adhan is uh, in a little bit, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. What's your name? Yusuf? Okay, can you stand up? And a special takbir for Yusuf, mashallah, who has taken the mic around. Takbir! 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 Jazakumullah khairan.
الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح حي على الفلاح الله أكبر الله الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله 